Game Time with Boomer Esiason. This week's guest is Mark Messier. Presented by GoDaddy and Geico. All right, today's guest scored the third most goals in NHL history, but he was better known for being the most complete player since the great Gordy Howe, and for his leadership, of course, and for the first man to captain two different Stanley Cup champions. He won six cups overall, which is amazing, five with the Edmonton Oilers and one with my New York Rangers. The NHL named its annual leadership award after this Hockey Hall of Famer, the great Mark Messier. Mark, welcome to game time. Good to be here with and you. I, and I love the fact that you wore that shirt. It's unbelievable. It's just, well, it just gives me goosebumps we're, to see we're, we're, we're the flag today for the 9-11 uh, trading day. Today, oh, so it was awesome. That's awesome. So let's start with you and where you began because your story is amazing. Uh, you started at the lowest levels of hockey. Your dad was your coach. What was that like having him coaching you at that young age? Yeah, it was amazing. Having a father who had played hockey was obviously a huge benefit. Uh, not only did I understand the game of hockey itself, but I understood the the game within the game because of the type of player he was. He was a, a rugged, tough defenseman that protected his teammates. And so he really understood the team dynamics of what it meant to be on a team and how you played as a team. When he retired from uh, playing hockey, uh, he, he started coaching right away and coaching youth and, and kids. And Did he give you a valuable lesson or any sort of tip to, to get you to where you got to? Many over the years, as you can imagine. Uh, certainly one that uh, I'll never forget uh, when I was 17 years old going to play uh, professional hockey in the, in the old WHA and, and I was fighting a lot in junior hockey and you know I had you know 250 minutes in penalty. You were and, fighting? Oh, it, it was, uh, everybody was back yeah. then, but I'll never forget he said, to remember that uh, in pro hockey everybody's tough. And sure enough, I got tangled up with a big guy in front of the net, and I was only 17. I turned around, and here was this guy with this one of those big Stan Makita helmets, <laughs> big Fu man shoe mustache. He drops his gloves and he starts boxing like this. <laughs> and I'm looking, I'm like, God, my dad was right. Look at this. So this is the guy's a monster. It was a valuable lesson there that uh, there's a lot of uh, not only great players, but mm -hmm. back then a lot of tough players, and everybody was tough at that. Yeah, you know, it was amazing. You signed a pro contract at the age of 17. So you went to Indianapolis, Indianapolis. ball place. The great Mark Messier is going to start his professional hockey career yeah. in the hockey bastion known as Indianapolis. Well, and there's another guy that started there as well, Wayne Gretzky. When I was flying from Edmonton to Indianapolis, he had just been traded. So he was flying from Indianapolis to Edmonton. And, of course, uh, I didn't know Wayne personally back then. And my, our first encounter together was when Indianapolis came to Edmonton, my hometown, uh -huh. and I played against uh, uh, That That Wayne. is amazing. Then you end up teammates, obviously, with the Edmonton Oils. We'll get right. to that in a yep. minute. But why is it that you only played five games for Indianapolis? Well, I, I, I don't know if many of the viewers know or many hockey fans know, but I have the distinction of being the youngest hockey player ever <laughs> to fold a, a professional franchise. At 17, Indianapolis <laughs> folded, and I went home after that. I played five ga games, went home, and continued my junior career with my dad coaching, and then Cincinnati phoned, and then... Cincinnati. There you go, Cincinnati phoned. And the Stingers. I, and I played 52 games the rest of the year with the Cincinnati Stingers. <laughs> My guest is two-time Hart Trophy Award winner Mark Messier, who teamed, obviously, with the great Wayne Gretzky to lead the Edmonton Oilers to four Stanley Cup championships. Then, when Gretzky left, the captain had perhaps his greatest season ever, leading his club to a fifth title. And we are just talking about you playing in Indianapolis and Cincinnati, and now you go back, essentially, home to Edmonton. And you're there with Wayne Gretzky. You guys arrived the same year. And you knew who he was, but you had never really met him, right? Well, he grew up in uh, eastern Canada. I was, of course, western right. Canada. Um, but uh, when he was 12 years old, a Canadian magazine did a big expose on him that this phenom had scored 375 goals and 400 and some assists, and some parents were mad at him for not passing the puck. But uh, um, <laughs> that, was, that was quite interesting. But, uh, yeah, so I think he got on everybody's radar uh, at that time. Um, and of course, being a young hockey player and seeing this story, uh, I knew of Wayne. So you're driving to Edmonton. Your dad's driving you there. Yeah. And you ask him the question, Dad, yeah. Yeah. you think that Wayne Gretzky's better than me as a player? Yeah, I asked my dad on the way there if, if he thought Wayne Gretzky was, was better than me. And, you know, he was driving along going, <coughs> well, um, um, what exit is it, Ken? You know what I mean? Like, uh, let's change the topic. But, so your uh, dad knew, obviously, of him and his everybody, reputation. Every, and everybody him. knew him. Of course, uh, you know, nobody can compare themselves uh, since or 
in the next hundred years, there'll never be another Wayne Gretzky in any sport uh, for what he was able to do statistically and from a team perspective and championships. And it's quite remarkable of uh, the career that he had. How does a team like yours, the Edmonton Oilers, who goes on to win five cups, four with Wayne, uh, kind of navigate through all the attention and all the, I would say, the credit, who scores the goals, who doesn't score the goals, who does the fighting, who plays defense. How does that work? When you have a great team, you have to convince players that um, perhaps they need to play a role that they don't see themselves in it. You have to convince them that that's the best thing for them and the team, and, and if we win, the stage is big enough for everybody. Mm -hmm. And Wayne, coming in, of, even though he was a rookie, he came in with a lot of panache and a lot of notoriety and mm -hmm. a lot of expectations but the way he treated everybody on the team and the way he accepted everybody on the team and the way he was with the press and all that really set a standard for all of us uh, uh, to create an environment that was not um, vindictive it wasn't uh, full of jealousy and ego and all the things that you would imagine with you know eight or nine hall of famers in fact uh, we were each other's best friends best supporters and we figured out very early on, which is the key to the success, yes. here, that, that the chances of Wayne Gretzky winning a Stanley Cup are probably pretty good. As yes. childhood hockey players, yes. we all wanted to win a Stanley Cup. So I figured out, I'm going to grab an oar and I'm going to start rowing and I'm going to do everything I can to support <laughs> him. And sure enough, we all did. And Wayne supported us back. And together, we created this incredible environment of camaraderie and sportsmanship. Maybe like the New England Patriots are where you have all these great players, a great coach, and obviously the greatest player of all time, maybe in Tom Brady, who is actively humble within the body of the team. Now, maybe differently outside, but once you're in that locker room, you've got to be one of the guys. I think that nowadays we, we kind of try to talk about that as, as creating culture, and culture really is about creating that kind of environment where everybody is important, everybody's needed, no matter whether you're playing two minutes or 60 minutes or whatever your role is on the team, without you doing that role the best you can, we can't be successful and we have to convince everybody that, uh, that that's what we need out of you. And I want to ask you when we come back about what would happen if somebody would take a run at Wayne Gretzky if they were stupid <laughs> enough and how you guys would react. We'll be back with more Hall of Fame Mark Messier right here after this. You're watching Game Time with Boomer Esiason. All right, welcome back to Game Time, everyone. We're here with Hall of Famer Mark Messier, and I love talking hockey with you, and I could do this for hours, <laughs> as people out there do know. So, you know, we were talking about Wayne Gretzky, and I was going to ask you, when you're in a game, and you can tell, let's say the Calgary Flames for whatever, they throw out the big team, and they know, and you know, that they're going to be coming after Wayne. What was that like? Was there anything said? Did anything have to be said? Or did guys like Marty McSorley just take care of business on their own? Yeah, well, we always had guys that were uh, nuclear deterrents, as we used to call them. Uh, yes. And uh, we had to be able to protect our players. And one of the things, uh, you know, years ago, you had to be able to get your team through the 82 regular season games in fairly good health. And if you didn't have enough uh, deterrence to do that, uh, oftentimes you were ba too banged up in the playoffs to, to be able to play four rounds there. So, um, yeah, we, we understood Wayne's uh, value to the team and as well as everybody else's. And, you know, we really uh, became a Packer in that regard. And, uh, we, but the thing about the Oilers I think that never gets discussed enough of because of all the skill that we had is that uh, we could play any game you wanted. Uh, we had a tough enough team. If, we used to say, if you can't beat them in the alley, you never beat them in the streets. And we could play any game any, any team wanted to. And I think is one of the reasons why we had the success that we did. Well, four cups with Wayne Gretzky. What was it like when you heard that he was going to be traded to the LA Kings? Oh, it was devastating for all of us. Uh, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire, as they say. I was out golfing. I heard the, the rumors that I was going, well, they can't trade. What are they talking about? They right. can't trade Wayne. And, and sure enough, uh, got the call that uh, they were going to do it. And in fact, we were finished nine holes. We were at the snack shack uh, after nine, having a beer and a, and a sandwich. And it came on, the, the, I think it was a transistor radio, if I remember, or some really? kind of TV <laughs> that uh, the, the deal was yeah. was done. And we were all just sitting there, couldn't believe it. It was and, like a uh, funeral, I would imagine. It was. And you can imagine, you know, we were in the midst, height of our careers, the middle of our careers, coming off a, you know, a Stanley Cup again. Um, Did he want to leave? Um, I think some ways, maybe, you know what I mean? I think that, uh, you know, what what became of it other than a lot of heartache for us and the people and the fans of Edmonton and having that kind of icon in the city that size, uh, um, 
is that it was probably the best thing for the game because it expanded the game, it created more jobs, uh, it inspired more kids uh, in the southern states to uh, to play hockey, and it really it really was an amazing thing for our game. But it was so painful when it happened there because we just couldn't believe it. We were we were ready to to win some more Stanley Cups, and, and we're hoping that the dream that we're living would never end. And, and it, of course, it came crashing down. Well, it came crashing down maybe that day, but you did go on to win more Stanley Cups. You did win another cup in Edmonton. What was it like achieving that goal without Wayne? Yeah, it was. It was, the next year was tough, and I don't, if a lot of folks don't remember, is that that year that he did get traded, we ended up playing Wayne in the playoffs, which was just incredible. That, okay, one thing to get traded or trading Wayne, but then to trade him to LA and then play them in the playoffs. And, and now you guys are the hunters. Yeah, and now we're playing against Wayne, and it was just so tough. And uh, we got up three games to one, and ended up losing that series, which was just miserable. Uh, we regrouped the next year and came back and uh, and won another Stanley Cup or fifth Stanley Cup in seven years in Edmonton, which was quite an achievement. Not only did you do it there, you did it here in New York, and you did it for the New York Rangers. And I'll never forget the day that you actually came to the New York Rangers and how happy we all were as fans. You know, and I get a little giddy. There's no question about it, because growing up, I was a Ranger fan, and we, you know, we hadn't won a cup since I was born. So um, this was a this is a crowning achievement for you. Now you are coming from Edmonton to New York, much like Wayne went from Edmonton to L.A. What was like, what was in your mind when that happened? I was ready for another challenge, uh, both from a professional standpoint and from a life uh, change. Uh, and coming to New York City, I couldn't think of anything better to come mm -hmm. to New York City, play for original six team, um, be a part of a team that could erase the the, uh, the curse, the, the drought, and the, the drought, curse, and all the that curse, kind of the whole stuff. Thing so is. I was—I I couldn't have been more excited when the, when the when the phone call finally came. And we're going to get into all of that with great. you and the New York Rangers awesome. right after this, as we get ready for another shift with the great Mark Messier. Stay with us. You're watching Game Time with Boomer Esiason. You know, when the Rangers acquired Mark Messier in the hopes of winning their first NHL title since 1940, general manager Neil Smith thought to himself, you know, if you have to build a team to win a Stanley Cup, this is the guy you automatically go and get. I knew that Mark didn't accept losing. And you know what? The, here's the thing about it is you, you are like an emotional guy. And I always say this, and I know I say this on the radio locally here in New York, that we're not allowed to cry until Mark Messier cries. Okay. Well, and okay, you cry good. a lot. You know oh, that. Oh, yeah, sure. You? Well, there's a, sports is emotion. I mean, if you don't play with emotion, and I think looking back now in my career more than anything there, how grateful I am to be have had the chance to play with such amazing uh, players that would take themselves to the limit, to their limits, mm -hmm. in order for the uh, benefit of the team. And I think everybody can be humbled by that. And anybody that's ever won will attest to that kind of feeling and um, having that kind of relationship with the players around them that, uh, like I said, and you know as well as anybody, nobody can win alone. So you're really at the mercy of the people around you and, and whether they're willing to uh, sacrifice everything they have in order to win. You know, you guys were crazy with the Stanley Cup in 1994 after you had beaten the Vancouver Canucks in, in seven games. And I'm just wondering, out of all the Stanley Cup celebrations that you've had with all of your teammates, uh, which one was the best? Well, I can tell you, Boomer, uh, I don't know which one was the best, but uh, after watching the recent uh, celebrations, we didn't shortchange ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> no, you didn't. We, we handled ourselves well. <laughs> yeah, but you, but you guys were also the reason why they now have a keeper of the cup. Because yeah, that was a got, good idea. That yes. was a good idea, yeah. That, um, that, that Stanley Cup was making it way through every single New York pub. And that's the beautiful part about yeah. that trophy is it's really the people's trophy. It's celebrated with, the, with its fans and uh, with our friends and, 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 as, and as well as taking it to schools and taking it to, uh, to hospitals. And the, the extent that that uh, cup travels after a victory is remarkable and uh, it touches a lot of people. In the championship series against the Devils for the conference, uh, you guys end up losing game five at home. A couple days later, getting ready to go play the Devils in New Jersey, and on the back page of the papers is, there's Mark Messier, <laughs> we will win. I will never forget that. I'm going, oh, my God, he's touching the money. What is he doing? Mm -hmm. uh, did you realize what you did, and did you realize how it was going to be portrayed? Um, I was so far along uh, in the investment into what we were trying to achieve that, 
I overlooked the how it was going to be portrayed. My inspiration getting up that morning was to try to figure out a way to instill the confidence that we had shown all year. We had beaten the Devils all year, uh, six times in regular season, probably the only thing that separated us from first and second for the mm -hmm. President's Trophy. And we, in my mind anyways, I felt we were a better team. Mm -hmm. And we got into a, into a playoff series that was tough. And they were playing good. We needed to figure out a way to play better. I, I just wanted the players to honestly know that, that I really believe, uh, because we had proved it, that we could go in there and win. So and now, I've talked to a couple of your teammates about this, right? And yeah. they've told me that you know they were actually having a lot of fun at your expense. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, oh, right? yeah. It was a long bus ride. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Especially dead cat is Brian Leach. Oh, I guess we're going to win tonight reading the newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> but it's great. And, and I remember the game, game uh, six. Mike Richter made a couple early saves that seemed like it saved the team. And then, of course, you score the hat trick. You know, well, I think that's what always gets overlooked in any game, that there's seminal moments that people remember because of the timing or whatever. And, of course, scoring three goals in a game like that is going to be recognized. But I, I've said from the, in, to the day that we talk about it that without Mike Richter that game, uh, we would have never won. Uh, the Devils came out and were playing incredible. They were just fast and big and strong defense and tough, big, strong forwards. And putting pressure on us in every angle and they got up to nothing and just out of a kind of a weird fluky play at the end of the second period we scored and, and, and to make it 2-1 after being that poorly out, or that badly outplayed and so we came in with kind of hope yeah. and I think they went into the dressing room kind of like you know like a little bit nervous now and the, and the whole game changed we became the hunters in the third period there they were trying to defend and of course gave us time to to collect ourselves, and, and then we went on and, and, and won the game. But what an amazing uh, series. <laughs> I'm thinking you, after the game at your locker, like, oh, thank yeah, God. Yeah, we didn't have time to enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> game seven was yeah, right around we, the corner. Yeah, it was over with. By the time we got on the bus, it was over with there. But here we are. What is it, 20 some, 25 years later, we're still talking about yeah, it. Yeah, we still are talking about it because it's one of the great, great achievements uh, in Ranger history, if not the greatest achievement in Ranger history. We'll face off with Mark Messier one more time after this quick timeout. Stay with us. You're watching Game Time with Boomer Esiason. You know, Mark Messier ended his Hall of Fame acceptance speech in 2007 by saying that championships weren't necessarily what he treasured most about his career. It's about the journey, he said, and the people you meet along the way and the life lessons you get from playing an incredible game. And they obviously named the Leadership Award after you. Mm -hmm. uh, that's legacy. That's, that's what that means. That's respect. Uh, what does it mean to you to know that that award stands for what you stood for on, on the ice? Well, it's humbling to have an award after, uh, you know, named after you for all the obvious reasons. But uh, I, I think when we started the award, um, it was to really kind of to acknowledge and honor the guys that were doing a great job um, on and off the ice mm -hmm. and, and leadership in their communities. And, and since then, it's kind of changed and more geared towards growing the game of hockey, which we all know is so important. Right. And, and we're seeing the diversity come into our game, and we're seeing the game expand in the southern cities now into China and all across the globe. So uh, I think everybody involved in the game that's had a hand in that can be proud. One of the loneliest feelings, if you can believe it, it was uh, at the end of a, of a championship run when the game, final game has been played and you're only there with the teammates in the dressing room and, and you know that tomorrow it's kind of done. Speaking of the last game, I don't know if you remember this. Do you remember this? Oh, yeah. That's, yeah uh, that's that doesn't special. get old. Yeah, that never gets old. You see what that says right there? Yeah, yeah. It says to Boomer. To Boomer, your best friend. Good luck, Wasp. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's my Wasp hockey team. I, I need a center or two if you want to play. I'm always but, available. Uh, but, you know, interestingly enough, I'm like right up in here. They didn't get me in this picture, but uh, this That would have been good. See, I see a face there, and I see uh, a smile there that, that is almost like th it's the first time all over again. Oh, it is. It is. After six, eight, people ask me that one of the most often questions that I get asked is what you'll know is the best and I say every time that's impossible to answer that because every one was so different every team had a different motivation for it uh, but we found something that galvanized us all together but when you get to that point 
with the group of guys that behind you there, there's there's nothing better. Well, I can't say how much I appreciate you coming in today, wearing that T-shirt for me. I know you just wore it for me. Just for you, Boomer. It's always I know great you're a huge to be. Ranger fan. Yes. Thank you for all the support. Yeah, I appreciate it. All right. <laughs> uh, thanks to Mark Messier and for you joining us today, and for all of you out there watching. I'm Boomer Sison, and I'll see you again soon right here on Game Time with Indy 500 winner Simon Pagano.